welcome to Once Upon a Die. Hello! Hello and welcome everybody to Once Upon a Die. Um, sorry for the slight delay in getting here. Um, I'm using a different machine once again uh, to stream today uh, and unfortunately uh, there was a glitch in getting it set up and it took me a few minutes to get on. But here I am. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Once Upon a Die. And today I have a very different experience from my usual. Um, I'm going to be doing something. It's a board game, but I'm going to be treating it the way I've treated the solo RPGs that I've played to date, uh, which is I'm, si I'm playing this sight unseen. Sorry, I just got to... Uh, cat hair on my glasses. I have not played this game before, uh, and so you are going to be experiencing it with me. And this kind of works with this uh, because um, this is a game that has no rule book. You simply play based on what the cards in the game tell you to do. There are seven instruction cards, and I actually was planning on reading them before I brought this stream to you so that I had an idea what's going on, but I actually decided it's going to be fun if you experience everything with me, and so that's what we're going to do. Uh, so, um, I just need to very quickly do that, and uh, let me bring myself down. So today... Uh, oh, that's not me. I just shrank something else on my OBS screen and I don't know what it was. Um, let me shrink down me. There we go. Oops, I uncentered that. Today we are going to be playing through Spire's End. Uh, this is a game I've been very excited about. I've been following it on Instagram for quite a long time, looking at the beautiful artwork that this game features, and I'm really excited to be sharing it with you today. Um, this is something that appeals, I think, to a lot of us. I'm just going to move my camera very slightly. Uh, sorry. Just so that I can get it a little bit more. There we go can center that a bit better. Uh, this is something that's going to appeal to a lot of us who knew what, uh, if, if you know what I'm talking about when I mention the fighting fantasy or choose your own adventure game books. This is a game very much in that style. Uh, you're going to be making a lot of options descending through, uh, you know, the adventure that it has uh, and making decisions that are going to cut out parts of the story, introduce other parts of the story, that kind of thing. And I'm really excited to be trying that. So let me get rid of the box cover. Um, I was very generously sent this copy of the game by Greg Favreau, the designer, and I would like to take a moment to say thank you very much indeed for that, Greg. Uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, be playing this game on here, uh, and uh, thank you very much for supporting that uh, and for supporting the channel. The one thing I realized I didn't do, um, I looked up uh, on the previous machine I was using to stream, the name of the artist. Uh, I said I was going to start crediting artists more, and I particularly want to credit this one. Uh, the artist is Benjamin Weissman, uh, and you will see why I want to make a particular point of uh, crediting Benjamin in just a second, because the artwork in this game is truly beautiful. Uh, sorry, I'm just setting up so I can actually see the chat while I do this. There we go. Hi, Jen. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, please do say hello in the chat. Um, also, uh, if you are watching this uh, on Twitch right now and you're not following me, please do. I would love more followers on Twitch. That's great. Uh, please also subscribe if you would like to, um, but do not feel you need to. Uh, also, I have a YouTube channel. If you head over to YouTube uh, and check out uh, Once Upon a Die, you will find my YouTube channel, and I would love you to follow me, subscribe to me there as well. Hit the bell for the notifications. I'm getting very, very close to 100 subscribers on YouTube, and as soon as I hit that number, I get to uh, have my custom URL. So that would be wonderful, because it would allow me to share it so much more easily. Um, but seriously, subscribing and that kind of thing really, really helps. Uh, it really makes a big difference in getting the word out. So as you'll see, I'm unpacking this astonishing deck of tarot cards. Uh, it's quite substantial. There we go. Uh, I got my camera angles slightly wrong. It is quite substantial. Um, and we're going to be playing with these. Uh, so the first thing I know I need to do is there are characters, the allies, I believe they are called. Uh, and so there are seven allies, and they are here on the bottom of the deck. And I'm just going to take them off. Seven. Uh, there's a status effect tracker. Uh, here we go. So I think these are all the instructions, right? Um... And then this, I'm assuming, is something I'm not supposed to see. So I'm going to turn that face down again. So here we have 11 cards. Uh, and I think 
yeah, instructions, and then this is actually a card, okay? So, uh, we're going to learn this game together. Instructions. Hello, Scott. Nice to see you. How are you? I hope everybody's keeping well. Thank you for joining me on this stream. Um, just for anybody who is here right now, uh, Scott Moyle, who is Moyle's Meticulous Minis, fantastic miniature painter. Um, I had a really good time watching uh, a lot of his stream yesterday. Uh, a consummate host and a wonderful miniature painter. Uh, do check his channel out, uh, especially if you have an interest in minis and painting minis and things like that. Um, and Loppy JCF, who is in the channel, Jen is a video game streamer who plays things like Hollow Knight, Vampire, uh, all that kind of thing, Hades. Um, and she is also a fantastic host and uh, a very entertaining streamer, so do check those two out if you would like to. Um, while I'm doing my plugs, I'm also going to plug into the Meepleverse, M-E-E-P-L-E-V-E-R-S-E, -E -E -E. that's Into the Meepleverse. Uh, that's run by Billy, who's another of my friends who does some fantastic board game work as well, including some solitaire stuff. Um, I'm all about solitaire, uh, Billy is about board gaming, but he got into Seventh Continent solitairing, um, and I believe he's just finished another campaign, or is about to finish. But anyway, check him out too. Um, into the Meepleverse, also a podcast run by Billy and Maggie, uh, and do go and have, an, have a listen to that. Scott says, doing well learning how screen printing works. Ooh, I have never delved into screen printing, but color me intrigued. I look forward to hearing your experiences with that. So Spire's End, uh, if you've just joined us, I've just literally unshrink wrapped the giant block of tarot cards over here. And we're about to read the instructions, which are on these uh, 10 cards. And then there's a couple of uh, status effect things over here. So let's learn what we're doing. Your expedition into the spire is transcribed on this deck of cards. They're in numerical order. To progress, simply reveal the cards like the pages in a book. Uh, navigational prompts will be highlighted in red to guide you. Uh, so we have this is nice and clear. We have these uh, reveal prompts and red uh, red text and things like that. Now this is one of the things I want to draw attention to straight away. And if we look at this little piece of artwork down here, all of the artwork in this is this wonderful shades of black and white, gray, and red. That's it. That's the entire color scheme of this game, and it is so striking. Um, so, uh, for example, if you're on card 10 and it states reveal card 20, you must advance to that card, and any card in between is removed from the game. So if the first card I draw says reveal card 30, I'm going to remove cards 1 to 30 from the game and read, well, sorry, 1 to 29, and then read card 30. Discard pile is where you put cards you have experienced, and you can look back at them any time that you like. Uh, if you're asked to pull a card, um, you will be revealing it out of sequence without advancing from your current card. So if I have to pull card 50, I simply take card 50 out of the deck and reveal it without uh, advancing to card 50 and discarding all the cards in between. If there are no advancement instructions on the card, move to the next numerical card when it's time. You will know when. Once your journey begins, don't reveal or shuffle any cards without specific instruction to do so. Such insight into the future will drive you mad. The mind is a frail thing that cannot handle the harsh realities of a rip in the space-time continuum. Reveal card two. So, there we go. Um, I'm sorry, I know I've just started, but my cat's decided it's food time an hour earlier than usual. Uh, and I think I do actually need to feed him. Uh, otherwise, he's going to be meowing throughout my entire stream. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to run a 60-second ad break. I will be right back. For those of you who can still see me while the ad runs, if that isn't the strangest break in a stream, I don't know what is. <laughs> Scott says, Timmy is boss. Yes, Timmy is boss. There is nothing I can do to avoid that fact. Um, okay. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, as Scott says in the chat, Timmy is indeed boss. Uh, okay, so on we go. 
Uh, ally selection. There are seven of us now. Seven of 518 souls. Be it divine intervention or fool's luck. Who knows? What I do know is that each of you will serve a purpose. Follow these steps carefully. I'm going to take these seven ally cards. I'm going to shuffle them. Wow, shuffling these is hard because they are big cards. Um, and then after I feel good about fate's course, I will reveal two allies. Uh, okay. Let's have a look. Do I feel good about fate's course? That feels good. So we are going to be playing as Sedani the Silversmith and Rolf the Kill Cow. These cards we put to one side um, because we are only going to be playing with two allies at any given moment. Uh, and if a character dies, we will bring other allies in, I believe. Um, so we are going to have... Oh, we keep the ally deck here, I see. So the ally deck goes here. The story deck goes here. And we have a discard pile. And we also have the action deck, which is these little small cards here. I have no idea exactly what these do. I am again unshrink wrapping them for the first time. Quick scan through at the beautiful artwork on these. I'm doing this deliberately fast. But it looks like this uh, this mask that we're seeing here gets different face paint and more aggressive as we go through. Anyway, I'll deal with that in a second. Um, we have a bunch of cubes. Um, we have cubes. I'm just going to put a couple back in the bag. I always do that just to remind me what the thing was for. There's only a couple of bags in this game, but I find it helpful. So we get HP cubes and AP cubes, which are health points and armor points. Um, uh, <laughs> Scott says, if I had to shuffle until I feel good about Fate's course, the stream would be a lot of watching me shuffle endlessly while staring into space. Yeah, it's tempting to just kind of keep going. Hi, Kapalis. Um, so I believe, I'm jumping the gun slightly here, but I believe I put HP, which is red, and AP, which is black, equal to the marked values on the card, which is five and five for her, and five and four over here, uh, Oops, to mark that that is their current HP and armor. Oh, Kapalis is Greg, Greg Favreau, hello. Uh, so Kapalis is the um, designer of Spire's End. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I, hopefully you'll catch me if I mess anything up along the way. I'm hoping I won't. Um, I, uh, I feel quite confident about this type of thing, but, you know, we'll see as we go along. Um, so we've got those. Uh, we also have four key dice, which are these guys. And at this point in time, I have absolutely no clue what these symbols mean, but we'll find that out shortly, I'm sure. And we have three D8s. Uh, if you haven't seen a d8 before, uh, that's an eight-sided die. Uh, it counts one to eight, and uh, opposing sides of an eight-sided die don't seem to add up to anything specific. I was about to say maybe they do, but they don't. Okay, so that's what all of our components are. Let's get rid of that. Ally card anatomy. So we've got uh, rest and boost meters over here. We'll find out what those do. Uh, this is indeed the hit point and armor threshold. So you get that many cubes of each type next to it. Um, we have the recoup bar, which is how you, I think, heal and, and uh, get yourself uh, back to rights after an encounter. Uh, we have the attack bars, which are these red lines down here. Bring this up a little bit. All these red lines are the different attacks that your character can make. Um, down at the bottom we have the death bar, which is the black one. I think that is a special ability that your character gets to trigger on death, but we'll see. Uh, I'm surmising based on looking at these. Um, and then status effects down the bottom. Um, I'm guessing that's things that they can do, but again, we'll see. Um, we've done the hit points. Um, if an ally runs out of hit points at any point in the game, of course they die. Um, and uh, armor is the ally's physical protection, and it takes damage uh, until it's depleted. If you run out of armor, then you start damaging uh, health points. Um, Scott says, yeah, standard D8 layout doesn't seem to have any logic, which drives me up the flipping wall in Flashpoint. I can believe that. Uh, Flashpoint Fire Rescue relies on uh, on a D... Is it, are you, you're talking about Fire Rescue, right? That has a D8 in it, doesn't it? Yes, it absolutely does. Um, and it's there's some very confusing uh, 
confusing uses of d8s in some games and you sort of think that the logic of flipping a die would make sense because opposing sides of a d6 always add up to seven. Not, case, not the case uh, for d8s. Jen says, I'm foreseeing a narrative podcast episode involving this game. Very likely, because no two playthroughs of this, I suspect, will be the same. And I imagine even if they could be the same, you just make one different decision and off you go down a different path. Anyway, actions. Uh, an ally's turn in combat consists of three steps. Actions, recoup, and upkeep. Uh, first, first ally goes, then second ally goes. Um, actions are options you have to do during combat to deal damage, heal, and perform special abilities. You get one action in a turn, used by spending hit points. Uh, they're located at the, the bottom of the uh, bar, in the red bars. So the number on the left, I'm going to bring this up for a little minute. Hey, time roller, how's it going? Um, Scott says it has a D8 you explicitly have to flip over sometimes. Flashpoint, fire, rescue. I'd want to set the game on fire, but it'd be redundant. <laughs> I do enjoy Flashpoint, but it can get frustrating. Uh, so yes, you see there the actions. On the left-hand side, the number in the circle is the amount of HP it costs to actually do the action. Um, and then you roll the dice, and the numbers tell you the result. Uh, so you can see there, for example, with Bulwark Bash, um, if you roll a 3 to 5 on the D8, you deal 1 damage, a 6 to 7 does 2 damage, and an 8 also does 2 damage, but also has a special effect. Uh, which in this case is a little armor symbol. Um, you sometimes get bonuses off lucky rolls. Uh, okay, so I would get, if I rolled an 8 on bul Bulwark Bash, I actually get an armor point back um, for doing a, a cool, cool move. Um, and if the result contains a letter, so for example, we see uh, in Frag Cannon, if I roll a 6 or a 7, I uh, get an A, and an 8 gives me a B, then I get to use the special move down at the bottom. So I've, I've, I've done a power move, essentially. Um, recoup step, the second step, lets you heal back up again. So once you've taken your uh, action, you've paid your HP, uh, rolled the dice and done what happens, you then get a chance to recoup. Um, you roll a D8, uh, and compare it to the recoup bar, and you get back the number of health points that are listed there. So one, two, or three health points, uh, whether I, as long as I roll a four or higher, I'm going to get some health points back. Um, there's also here uh, a separate action, uh, which is also one, two, or three. Um, that I'm going to guess, that's rebuild as opposed to recoup, uh, as opposed to heal, rather. I'm guessing that means that they improve their armor back? Um, recoup bar example. Yeah, it's the same. Um, can I just check that with you, Greg, just while I'm reading through, just to keep myself moving? Am I right in saying that the Silversmith's rebuild is just the same as heal, but for armor? Um, I'm sure I'm going to come across something that tells me that in a second. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, you can also rest uh, to make up for lost hit points. Um, that will grant you, if you just skip an action straight up, you gain a hit point back on your first rest. If you do it again, you'd get two hit points. If you do it again, you get three hit points. Uh, and that's what you use this rest meter for uh, up here, the little time. And you can also use this potion here for boosting. Uh, you get, um, that actually allows you to get extra health points uh, or armor points. Um, and once you've filled it up, you get a strength for a turn. Uh, we will see what that all means in a second. Then you get upkeep. Um, you can be stunned, burned, or healed, uh, for, to name a few examples, during combat. All of them affect you differently, and at the end of each ally's turn, you keep track of those effects. Um, strength is added to your recruit roll. Thank you. Um, upkeep, managing, uh, managing status effects on an ally. Um, oh, sorry, the resting bonus added to your recruit roll. Got it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I am reading this a little bit quickly. Uh, on your recoup or heal result. Right, so if I keep resting, then when I eventually do that uh, recoup or heal roll, I get the bonus back. Uh, I appreciate the clarification. Um, status effects are temporary modifiers. I'm sure anyone who's played an RPG is familiar with them. 
Uh, they can affect you positively or negatively. Um, there is a glossary. Uh, so we have a status effects glossary here that lists all the positive and negative effects. I will be keeping that open next to my game so that when I run across them, we can see what's what. Um, there are two common examples that come into play, which is regen and bleed. Regen uh, heals you a little bit. Bleed uh, damages you a little bit as time goes on. Um, and the number... So this icon here, this little like rotate icon almost, that indicates how many turns it's going to go on for. So if I get this bleed effect as it's written here, I would put three cubes on my ally, and for the next three turns they are going to lose my, uh, an HP. Um, during upkeep, you remove one Q, um, and that is when you trigger the effect. This will continue until all, all cubes have been removed. That makes complete sense. And if you suffer bleed again, you add cubes on top. Uh, okay, that makes total sense to me. Enemy combat. Uh, enemies follow the same three steps. Um, at the same time as the attack roll, there will be a selection roll, which is 1d8, to determine who they're going to attack. Uh, basically, if they roll a 1 to 4, they attack here. If they roll a 5 to 8, they attack here. Um, so you roll a d8, work out who's being attacked, and then draw an action card to determine the action that they perform. Uh, and they will have an action bar. So, for example, this is, action, uh, this is number 1. It will trigger action number 1 on their card. Um, they do not spend HP to perform attacks, but otherwise they behave the same. Uh, recoup and status effects are dealt with the same way. Um, damage goes through armor first, then hit points. That makes sense. Um, you cannot split up uh, damage. So if I deal four damage to something, I'm dealing it to one thing. I can't do the excess one damage that I didn't need to do to something else. Um, that makes sense. Combat round, uh, that's just a review. Action, recoup, upkeep, action, recoup, upkeep. Then the enemy goes, that makes sense. Uh, there's a combat legend, so I'm going to keep that open. Uh, then we get loot. You might find loot uh, during the game. Uh, some of them could be good, some of them could be bad. Uh, they are listed in black strips at the bottom of story cards. So you can see this card example here has a black strip at the bottom of it. Um, when you get an item, choose an ally to give it to, then place the item and the ally card, uh, making sure that the uh, strip is visible. Makes sense. You can get combat and story items. Um, story items could have abilities, uh, but they can also trigger events outside of combat. That makes sense to me. Each ally can have three combat items and an unlimited number of story items. Makes sense. You can swap out combat items during an encounter and upon death, when you bring in your next ally to continue playing the game, they get everything that you had. Uh, that all makes total sense to me. And then death and quick start. Uh, if an ally dies, you trigger their death move, uh, which is the black action bar down the bottom. Um, so for example, the silversmith, uh, if the silversmith dies, they will rebuild three armor uh, or sorry, they'll rebuild uh, over the next three turns on chosen target, which will give them an armor back. Um, if an ally dies during an encounter, a new ally takes their place until all allies have, have perished. There are seven of us. Uh, go as long as possible. Journey ends when all of your allies die or when the story comes to its natural conclusion. And this is the important part. There are many. There are lots of uh, resolutions to this. Most of them are grim. Uh, progression is based on your choices. What you do matters. When your journey ends, have the courage to play it out again. Perhaps different choices will garner better results. So, to quickly uh, start a new game... Oh no, that's after your first playthrough. Okay. So, here's my stats effects tracker, which I'm going to put down here. Can we see all of this? No. I'm going to move myself into this corner over here, because I think that's going to be less used. And I'll just move the armor up a fraction. Oh, I see. Right, because my screen's off the thing. There we go, yeah. Into the corner. Um, I'm going to put my stats to tracker. Scott says, you're a combat legend. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll see whether that holds true or not. Okay, so with that very quick rules overview taken care of, uh, I think I understand what's going on. Let's have a go. Prologue. So we see, begin here. And those look like the results, some of the results, they look like the symbols that are on the dice. So interesting. Prologue. Look at this artwork. Just look at it. 
I mean, it's gorgeous. And those strikes of red just to highlight something. Love it. It was unusually dark before the moon was swallowed in red. Crimson light circled the dark orb like a bloodshot raven's eye. The ground shook and something unimaginable drilled its way out of the earth. It tore through the town with ungodly force. The streets filled with fumes and the townsfolk fell into a deep, unnatural sleep. The strong, the frail and the innocent all disappeared under the red eclipse. The spire stood there in silence. At its base was a door left ajar. Reveal card two. Oh, right. I'm just going to shuffle this up because I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to have done that. Ooh. Sorry. Immersion breaking. I started the story and then went meta. Okay. Still part of the prologue. This card says, we'll paint this place with their blood, sweat, piss, and tears. Uh, actually, that's a point. Two things right now. One, spoiler warning. This story, you know, my story that I'm going to experience is about to be spoiled for you. Second thing, this is, as I understand it, uh, an adult game in the sense that it is does not shy away from violence and graphic descriptions. So just be warned of that before we keep going. Dust and debris. You wake, horrified, gasping for air. Your head is pounding and you're covered in dust and debris. You unearth yourself and climb to your feet. A monstrous foreign object spirals above you, like the horn of a giant deity attacking the heavens. A quick glance reveals endless mounds of wreckage in every direction. It's strangely silent and you see no one about. You head off through the destruction to find your uncle, your last living relative. Thankfully, his cottage is outside of the spire's wake untouched. He left you a note. I know you will come looking for me. Don't. I deeply regret what I've done, but during this incident, I hid, then ran like a whimpering dog. In truth, I'm a coward, crippled by fear. You're strong, courageous. Everything I'm not. That's why you must go. I suspect those missing are being held captive in that spire. Mount a rescue. Find them. Free them. I am proud of the person you've become. You must remain strong. I fear many hardships and horrors lie ahead. Know that shame has clawed through my soul and I won't survive long. I've made sure of that. But before I go, I have some knowledge I need to pass on. Okay, at this point in time it says check through the instructional deck. Obviously I've already done that. Reveal card three. Chapter one. Cautious steps. L look at the art. This is gorgeous. Love it. You approach the door with a cautious step. I warn you, it's worse in there than you think, and you've imagined the unimaginable, no doubt, says an unfamiliar voice. A small creature reveals himself from behind the door. He is unkempt, a little worse for wear. His eyes appear kind. What are you? You've never seen this creature before. I've always been close, but you people are far too involved with yourselves to notice. We live right beneath you. Only this thing here is from much, much deeper, he mutters, looking up at the spire. What do you know about this? you ask, hopeful. I've squirreled around. These underdwellers have horrible red eyes. They move silently and quickly. He stops and sniffs the air. I must go. With that, he scampers off into the spire. You move to follow him when you see it. Red eyes cutting through the darkness. You attack. Reveal cards four and five. The doorman set up. Okay, so we get to, this is instructional. We get set up instructions. Greg says you're a great narrator. Thank you very much, Greg. I appreciate that. I'm hoping I'm doing the game justice. Set up the encounter as it's pictured below. Place the doorman in the play field above your ally cards. Put his hit point and armor point cubes next to him. The bleed damage skips armor points and damages hit points directly. Okay, after an, any encounter, allies in play region uh, in play regain all hit points and armor points. Any status effects and boost meters are cleared. If you defeat the doorman, reveal card six. I strongly hope that that if is unwarranted, and it's when I defeat the doorman, but we shall see. Um, <laughs> Scott says, sometimes I wish David would read me bedtime stories. His voice is just the best. Thank you. That's very, very kind. Um, okay, so here is our doorman. 
Uh, I'm going to set this up slightly differently because of how I've laid out my table. Um, I'm actually going to, just going to move the cubes off camera. I'll bring them on when they're relevant. Here is our doorman uh, surrounded by keys. Uh, he has 10 health and 4 armor. This guy is... Well, I say he's dangerous. I don't know if he's dangerous. I don't know what dangerous is in this game, but that's a lot more health than I've got. Uh, so he gets 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 health. I'm just going to move the dice. I'll bring them in when they're relevant. There's 10 health and 4 armor. Okay, so I've got a lot of damage to do. All right, so... Uh, I'm just going to have my combat review down here. So the first thing is, I ally number one gets to perform an action. Greg says, I've heard this a few times. This is the best narration by far. Bless you, that's very kind. Uh, battle advice, go big. Well, that seems reasonable, especially with the recoup options available. So let's have a look down here. I'm going to go semi-big right now. Um, so point of note, uh, the silversmith here has a cannon strapped to her left wrist. I mean, that's just badass. Uh, so, we're good. Yeah, we will go big. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, I could just frag cannon out the gate. Uh, but, I mean, that's four health out of five. That's going to... Um, okay, so actually, here is one question, and I may have missed this. But just for clarification, the health expended to do uh, battle actions, does that start with armor as well? Or is fatigue like draining your health automatically? Um, I'm assuming from everything I've read, unless I skipped over something, uh, that armor still goes first. But I just want to make sure I'm doing that correctly. Um, so... I could do three damage. Encourage. Okay. Encourage plus one attack damage if you have plus one on the highest roll. Okay. So what I could do here is I could spend... I am going to go a little big at any rate. Uh, I could spend... No, you only spend HP. Okay, so th this this is going to take straight away from my HP. So armor is actually highly important. Um, so I could spend 2 HP to do mini cannon here, which is going to do 2, 3, uh, or 3. Uh, and if I do the third 3, I get an armor back. Uh, not that I've lost any yet. Um, force deflection will do 3, 4, and 4. Uh, getting the armor back more readily, but also with a possibility of encouraging an ally. And the frag cannon will do uh, 4, 4, and 4, but with the potential of encouraging even more and guaranteeing the armor back. Well, I haven't lost any armor yet. Um, so I think I'm going to save that move for my second attack, and I think I'm going to go mini cannon. So I spend 2 HP, um, and I'm going to throw a D8. Uh, and I'm looking to get, let me just check one thing, where's my combat step gone? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to roll a d8 and see what happens. So, Greg says don't rimp out, wimp out, risk it. <laughs> I, I have strategy in mind. I am not going to wimp out. Um, but I do have slight strategy in mind. So I'm going to roll a d8, and I roll a 5. 5 on the mini cannon is 2 damage, so I take off 2 armor from the doorman. Um, okay. Uh, that would have been 3 or 4 damage if I'd gone higher. I take your point, but I still have strategy in mind. Um, so I have done that. I then get to recoup, so I get to roll on the uh, heal uh, track. So uh, four to six, four or above basically is going to get me some of my health back. That's a four, so I get one health back. Oh, I just took that from my other character. Let's not do that. Okay, yeah, okay, start. Um, let's have a look and then upkeep. There's no upkeep to do because uh, nothing happened during that turn to to encourage upkeep. So uh, going on to Rolf, the kill cow. Let's look at this. So Rolf is armored with uh, like a kind of spear shovel but also has this... Uh, oh, I'm just going to reset my camera. It's fallen slightly out of sync. Properties, refresh. Um, there we go, that's better. So he's got this kind of creature sitting on his shoulder, um, which is awesome. So uh, here, um, if I want to do some serious damage, I'm going to have to do uh, a little bit more. Uh, here's an interesting one. 
so looking at this, this has an asterisk attached to it. Um, did I see something with an asterisk attached to it? Right, represents the number you roll. So if an attack does damage asterisk and you roll five, it inflicts five damage. Okay, so that's quite potent. Um, ah, I see what it does. So it gives, for example, feed. Uh, will do two to five damage. It will damage them on a two, but only doing two. Uh, whereas if I roll a five, I do the full five damage. So that's actually a really intriguing mechanism. I like that a lot. Um, and he can either dwindle or cripple the enemy, which has the effect of either 50% uh, damage output, which could be really nice, or minus one attack damage. Um, okay, this is, this is interesting. I like this. Uh, I'm going to go snappers. So I'm going to spend three HP. I'm going to roll my d8. Three. Well, that's rubbish. Uh, okay, so I do three damage. So I take away his two armor, and now I'm attacking his HP directly. Uh, so he has now lost an HP. He has nine left. Um, that's that. I roll a d8 to recoup. Two. I don't get anything back, so I've got to be careful of my kill count. I see now why it's so easy to lose characters in this. Um, uh, Jen says, I love the aesthetic of a peasant weapon, referring to this sort of spade spear here. Uh, someone using a farming gardening tool as a weapon and the creature familiar on his shoulder is amazing too. Very true. And then Greg says, this was a fun one to make, Rolf. I didn't want any swords and for it all to be sort of strange. I really like that. Like, it's not conventional. Also, swords, um, massively overused in any kind of medieval fantasy and things like that. I'm not saying this is medieval, but that sort of style. Swords were not the primary weapon back in the day. Spears were far more common on a battlefield than swords were because swords were expensive to make. They used a huge amount of metal compared to a spear, which is a wooden pole with a little knife on the end, essentially. Spears were far more common. So it's actually more accurate to have people using weapons. I mean, obviously here, this is fantastical and, you know, someone can afford to strap a cannon to their wrist. Money is not so much of an object. But it is interesting to see something that uses swords a little bit less. So I appreciate that, Greg. Okay, so we've recouped. There are no, no effects to deal with here. So it is now the doorman's turn. So I've shuffled up my cards. Just do a tiny bit more shuffles. And let's see what the doorman decides to do. The doorman... Oh! The doorman is going big out of the gate. Key burst. Um, so I'm thinking I just had a bunch of keys thrown at me. Um, so three, three or above, it's going to do damage. Uh, so first up, I have to roll... Uh, I'm going to roll the red dice to decide the ally. So one to four, five to... Okay, so that's a one. It's going to be attacking Kedony or Sedony. Mm, not sure on that. Uh, and then roll the d8 for the attack. Seven. Oh, yikes! That is six damage. So she loses five armor and a health. Wow, that hurt. Okay, so Doorman is serious. Got it. Um, Doorman is going to recoup. Uh, that's only a heal on a 4+, plus. that's an 8, that's 2 health back, uh, can only have 1 health because the other one, oh hang on, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah, the other one was armor and does not have a rebuild action. Um, ouch. Uh, yes, uh, Greg says you can roll the red and black dice together, do it all at once. I'm going to do that moving forwards, I just wanted to do a demonstration thing of it slightly out of turn. Now one thing I just want to check. Um, I guess I just discard that action card, or do I shuffle it back into the deck again? Uh, sorry, again, this is probably clearer in the rules, but because I'm rushing. Greg, do I uh, shuffle the used action card back into the deck? Jen says spears were also easier to use. You poked your enemy or threw the weapon at them and hope for the best. Swords require basic weapon training uh, to use properly. Most common folk would not have had the training necessary to use them. Though on the other side of that, someone not using a weapon properly can be dangerous in and of itself uh, because one doesn't always know what they're, what they're resorting to doing. That's true. You could just flail a sword around like a mad thing and you'll probably be pretty dangerous. Um, makes me think of the goblin fanatics in, uh, in Warhammer, um, which basically tiny goblins with a ball and chain that's bigger than their head and you, you amp them up on mushrooms and let them go and they just went completely nuts spinning around in any which direction and they were just as likely to go straight through your own troops as they were to actually go through the enemy uh reshuffle the deck once the encounter's over that makes complete sense 
Uh, I probably just missed that. Okay, so we are back over to Sedony, who... Now I understand why you said if you beat the doorman. Um, wow. So, back to Sedony's action. She only has 3 HP, so I've got to be... I'm going to mini cannon so I don't kill her, because if I use 3 HP, that would. Um, so let's roll the dice, or the die. Eight! Oh, that's the result I wanted. Okay, so mini cannon on an eight does three damage, so I'll take away three health, and gives me back one armor. Uh, I'm then going to recoup. Now, I have the choice of uh, rebuilding or healing. Um, I'm going to heal, I think. For five, uh, that's one health. That's not a lot. But it at least lets me do something next turn. I could always do a shield thrust. Uh, which, you know, obviously thrusting out with a shield, uh, it does have a very, very spiky thing on it. But that's only going to do one damage on a five to eight, so that's a little higher. Mr. Gaboobly! Hello, nice to see you. Uh, another video game streamer in the channel, everyone. If you're looking for another video game streamer, Mr. Gaboobly does uh, some fantastic streams of uh, things like Cuphead and Hades and things like that. Uh, and... Uh, sets himself fitness challenges, so every time he dies on something uh, in a game, he will do push-ups and things like that. Uh, just a note, you can give recoup to another player. I did catch that, yes. Uh, although one thing I didn't catch, and since uh, you're here to answer my questions, I may as well ask you. Um, I did read the recoup to other players, but do I give them... I assume I give them their own recoup. Uh, so if I give them recoup, do I give them their own bar? So if it's Rolf's turn, does Kedany get to do one of these? Uh, or is it based on Rolf's um, uh, Rolf's recoup line? So Kedney's done that. She doesn't have any upkeep, so it is over to Rolf's turn. Rolf has two health left. I'm not going to kill Rolf either, so I'm going to spend one to prune. So four or above is going to do some damage. That's a five. That's only one damage, unfortunately. Um, wow, this this is is uh, harsh. Uh, Kedney can do her recoup and give it to her. Oh, right, so like Rolf, for example, if I uh, heal Rolf right now. Um... Oh, hang on a second. Is this Kedney? And give it to another ally. She is like a shield healer. Sorry, I just want to understand I'm understanding you correctly there, Greg. Uh, she can do her recoup as in, so I roll a seven and she gets uh, two health back. Uh, she gives that health to herself and to somebody else? I just want to make sure I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying there. Um, well, let's see. I'm going to roll for Rolf's uh, recoup now anyway. Um, let's see what happens. Whoop. Seven. So that's two health back. Um, so Rolf has more armor. You can give that to one or the other. Right, got it. So yeah, I'm going to give that two health to uh, Kedany because she needs it, because she has very little armor left. All right, the doorman is going to have a go. Um, so first things first is enemy selection and action. The action is going to be... Oh my lord! I shuffled this deck badly. Kedney takes four damage. So she is down to one health left. Thank goodness she's still alive. Uh, the doorman is going to recoup. And it's going to recoup five, which is one health. Um, wow. Ah, uh, yikes. Okay. Uh, Kedany, I think. And I just want to check. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, you can't split. So, that was, that was what we were saying earlier. You can't split damage done. And I don't think I clarified this. But you also can't split health restored. So Kedany got two health back there from Rolf. I couldn't have done one and one. It has to be everything to one character. Uh, I just want to double check one thing. Yeah, so I am actually going to rest Kedany right now because this is very dangerous. Uh, health or armor? Four to six is one. Okay, so the results are the same either way. So Kedany is rested for one turn. She gets a plus one, therefore, on her die for recouping. I am going to give her armor back. So she's rebuilding. That's a six, which is still only one armor. So if she gets hit again, that's going to go real bad. Rolf really can't do much, because if I spend that HP, he's going to die. So he's going to use his shovel 
Uh, five to eight does one damage. Or should I recoup? This is dangerous, but I'm actually just going to go... Uh, you can only do health on resting. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. I did do the rest, so actually she gets one health back. That's fine. That makes complete sense. Uh, I guess I was thinking could have been time... Um, time spent rebuilding the armor. But no, resting, resting to restore health makes sense. Um... I have a 5 to 8 chance of doing 1 damage that he's probably going to get back. Rolf is going to rest as well, so plus 1 on the recoup roll for healing, and is going to try and give that to Kedany. 6, that's a 7, that's great, so Kedany gets 2 health back. Now I have to hope that whatever happens now is not chronically dangerous. The doorman is a... I'm just going to do one more shuffle of this deck, because 2 sixes in a row right out the gate is harsh. Greg says it's not usual to have an ally die on this counter. It's about 50-50. Uh, oops. One strategy is to have a dedicated rester pump into the other character. I was just thinking about that. Um, and I might go that route. I, wasn't, I was hoping I was going to get more health back, but that was obliterating. Uh, okay, let's see what the doorman chooses to do. You all just saw me reshuffle that deck, right? Okay, Doorman is going all out on me. That's a four, that's three damage to Kedney. Somehow, she is still alive. I don't know how Kedney is actually surviving this, but she is. Uh, Doorman is gonna recoup. That's an eight, gets two health back. Can you have two health back? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wow. This is brutal. Um, okay. Okay, you know, this is the nature of these games. Uh, it's harsh, but we deal with it. Um, okay, uh, Kedany is going to rest. What I should be doing, incidentally, when I do these rests is just taking a cube and placing it here so that I have an idea of uh, what the rest total is, but I'm resting once and then using it immediately anyway. So uh, Kedany is going to rest. She is going to uh, heal. That's, oh, that's an eight anyway, so that's three health back. Uh, that makes me feel a little better about things. Uh, Rolf is going to try and do that one damage just to try and keep the doorman low. So five to eight. That's a three. Nothing happens. Uh, then going to heal. Um, not rested. So this is a regular heal roll. That's an eight. Sorry, that rolled off screen. I've been doing these off screen, haven't I? Okay, new rule from now on in. All rolls have to be on screen. Um, okay. So, uh, that's an 8, which is 3 health. Uh, that 3 health is going to go back to Rolf, actually, because I can't give 3 health to Kedney. That would be a waste to try, because her maximum is 5. What's the doorman doing? A 2. Finally, something that isn't blooming lethal. Stab. Um, so, on a 4 or more, we'll do some damage. That's a 1. Amazing. First attack against Rolf and misses. Um, oh, you build that up. Oh, I keep that marker on, so that was actually a... You don't use it up when you uh, uh, actually use your rest. I missed that, thank you. So they are on... And that's an ongoing bonus then. Thank you. So Kevney should be on two rests, and Rolf is on one. Okay, so the doorman failed. They are still going to recoup. That's a seven, that's one health back. One, two, three, four, five, six. So back to full health. Great. Okay, well, Kedney has the ability to do some damage. Uh, I'm just going to spend three health and go for force deflection. Uh, three or more does damage. Um, let's go for a nice high roll, please. That's a three. Okay, well, three damage done. I'll take it. Uh, the recoup phase um, gets a plus two. Um, yep, perfect. So I'm going to get plus two for this. I'm going to heal, because I think just being able to do damage to this guy right now is important. That's a 6, plus 2 is 8, so that's 3 health back. I'll take that. Okay, Rolf. Uh, Rolf has 4 health now. Um, I'm going to spend 3 to do the snappers. Um, and that is going to result in a 4, which is 4 damage. Finally, I'm actually hurting this guy a bunch. 
Um, on Rolf's recoup roll, that's a two. Uh, he gets plus one, so he gets no health back. The doorman does a five, which is key swarm. Uh, there's a star here. This attack ability affects all opposing targets in play. Seriously? Oh, wow. The rest clears. Sorry, I think I'm, I might be slightly confused now, Greg. You're saying here that you get plus one the first time, plus two the second time, plus three, then it clears. Um, so it just, it clears when you use it to boost your heal, or it clears only after you get plus three? I just want to clarify that, because I, I, I did the, uh, uh, the clear after using it first time around, uh, and so I'm just wondering if, because I didn't put the marker there, I've thrown things off slightly. In the meantime, let's see what this key swarm does. Six. Um, six on the key swarm is two damage to everybody. So Kedany takes two health and Rolf takes two armor. Uh, no additional effects. The doorman is going to recoup and is going to recoup one health. It clears if you break the rest chain. Okay, yeah, so they, they should both be off then. Uh, which actually means Kedney did got, not get the plus two. I think should be only on one health. because I did plus one, and then I used it. No, I used it both times. Oh, Kedney's dead. Because she rolled a six. So And she was two health down, because so, she only got one health back. So she got one health back, so she would have had two, and just took two damage, two damage from the key swarm. Kedney is dead. Uh, so she gets her death move. Uh, she gets rebuild times three on chosen target, uh, which means Rolf over here... And I'm actually going to use black markers to do this because their armor gets three rebuild on his armor, which means at the end of every turn in the in uh, Rolf's upkeep phase, one of these cubes comes off and Rolf gets one armor back. So I'm using the black cubes because I can just swap them across. Kedney, however, is dead, which means I bring in the next ally. Wow. Um, Leo Frick, the forester, has. Five health and two armor. Okay. All right, let's see what we can do. Uh, so uh, that was the doorman's turn. The doorman gained one health back. So it's now Leofric's turn. Um, so Leofric has an antlered rabbit on his shoulder and a very, very big axe, as well as what looks like a tapped beer keg. Uh, this character is awesome. Uh, and there's some attacks. So has the ability to pierce the enemy, um, which ignores the armor on the target, and the ability to give an ally luck, which means they get to roll twice and pick the best roll. Okay. Also, uh, these two uh, icons here on uh, antlered and splintered, that double sword thing, means that that attack happens twice during one action. And the little star there, which is actually what the doorman has on Key Swarm, that means that that attacks everybody in play. Not that relevant when there's only one bad guy, but... Uh, okay. Um, Leofric is going to mash, uh, which is his 3 HP attack. And we're going to... Four! That does four damage. The doorman is dead. Good. Uh, oh, uh, I said antlered rabbit. That's a jackalope. Um, that is a jackalope, because his death move is jackalope justice, which is also one of the best phrases I've ever said out loud. Uh, <laughs> Timber hack and end it. Well, I mean, I mashed and ended it, but... Um, got it. Okay, so... Uh, finally, the doorman is dead. Took down Kedany in the process. I mean, ouch. Um, do, 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 do. And then I'm just checking, I can't, where is this? At the end of combat, um, do, 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 do. at the end of combat, do I just get all my health back? I did read that somewhere. And now I can't see it. Hmm. 
This is a problem with... I Maybe I... Yeah, everyone tops off. Okay, yeah, I thought so. Uh, this is maybe the one downside of me not having read these cards before I came into this, but I did want to do this. I thought this would be fun to do Sight Unseen because it, you kind of do learn as you play. Okay, everybody tops off. The Doorman is dead. There is no black bar down the bottom here. This is the status effects that he can cause during combat. Um, so there's nothing on this card to keep. We're just going to discard it and draw the next card. Victory! Increase ally armor point thresholds by one. Uh, that's great. Oh, I take those three cubes off, uh, off Rolf. That's great. So their armor goes up by one. Pull card 32 to mark this accomplishment. So remember, pull does not mean I jump to card 32. I just take it out of the deck and reveal it. Uh, so here is card 32. Ally threshold counters. So this just keeps a... Oh, goodness, I'm getting very full here. I'm going to put the ally cards off screen and I'll draw them when I need them, or mostly off screen. Uh, so the ally uh, card counter here, armor is plus one. The creature is bleeding on the floor facing you. He shifts a bit, still alive. What have you done with them? You know it understands you, regardless of what language it speaks. Around him are keys, at least ten of them. Some are chained to him, others loose. Two keys are directly in front of you. It could be your imagination, but it looks like one is beginning to move. Now I have a choice. I can finish him off and take everything. I can leave him, take what he has, and move on. Or I can take him captive. I'm not going to lie, I'm nervous of that key that's moving. Um... But... Uh... A doorman? I'm going to guess the doorman probably controls the keys to a certain point, so I'm going to try taking him captive. So I reveal card 9, so I'm just going to discard... Uh, sorry, 7 and 8 I don't look at, I just take them out the game. And I reveal card 9. Helping hands. You take action and lop off his hands. The creature drops to his knees. Roll 1d8. 6. Leave him. I doubt he'll be of any use. The small creature you met earlier is at your side. Oh, sorry, that was him. Leave him. I doubt he'll be of any use. The small creature you met earlier is at your side. He places a small patch beneath the Underdweller's wrist, draining some blood into it. He tosses you the pouch. Keep it. Light is scarce in this awful place, and the blood glows. Now kill him. You do as instructed. Before you can ask any more questions, your small friend has slipped away again. Okay, so I've got the bag of blood. Um... I can use 2 HP to give luck to an ally for 2 turns, and I can only use it once per encounter. Equip this card, reveal card 13. Well, I'm going to give that to Rolf, because Rolf has more armor. So what you do is you just tuck it under like that, and I can see that he has... And that's a combat item, so I can only have 3 of them. Uh, I'm going to reveal card... What was it? 13? Um... Oh, I just put it down here, didn't I? Reveal card 13. So 10, 11, and 12 go out of the game. Here is 13. Sunshine. Sunbeams punch through the dusty air onto the back wall. The light blazes a hot orange in between two corridors. There are signs of a struggle. A dead underdweller is lying face down in front of you with some overturned furniture. Glowing red blood trails along the floor haphazardly toward the left. You suddenly feel warm, humid air hit the back of your neck. Something tall and thin darts through the sunlight. You wait a moment and brace yourself for an attack, but none comes. In the midst of this chamber's stark isolation, you hear a hum. There is a small flicker of light from the left corridor, and the humming increases. The orange rays of sunlight start to fade away as the morning begins to pass. The room grows dark. You should move along. I can follow the tall, thin creature into the corridor on the left, or I can avoid the mysterious creatures in the dark and go to the corridor on the right. Hmm. Interesting. The left corridor has the humming and a small flicker of light. The right one. If I want to avoid mysterious creatures in the dark, maybe going towards the flicker of light? Uh, but equally, I don't know anything about the door on the right other than it exists. Red, red blood trails along the floor toward the left. Interesting. So that doesn't say, did this Underdweller 
with some overturned furniture. So did the fight happen here? And then whatever killed, whatever underdweller killed this one, walked down the, the, the corridor to the left door? Or did this guy come out of the left door and then collapse over the furniture? Hmm. Jen says, don't be the character that gets themselves in trouble by following the trouble. You've watched horror movies, right? Don't follow the sound. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if the blood came from this guy or from whatever killed him that's gone down there. So I'm going to go to the right. So that's card 17. So 14, 15, 16, go away. Uh-oh. That's a fight, I think. The twins. Giant pillars mark the entrance to the next corridor. Obsidian tile stretches in every direction. It's dark, unsettling, and uncomfortably warm. As you cross the chamber floor, two dark forms appear from either side. They slide towards you with supernatural speed as if pushed by a sudden and violent wind. They attack in unison. Roll 1d8. 3. The masked figure on the right makes the first move. A fist sweeps across your face. An ally suffers one damage. Start of encounter. Huh. Interesting. Uh... Okay, so a 7 or an 8 would have been good for me. This was the medium roll. Uh, 7 or 8 would have been really good for me. Uh, 4, 5 or 6 would have been really bad for me. Um, the 1, 2 or 3 is the okay result. And I'm going to attack revealing cards 18 and 19. Uh, Scott says see if you can split the party, you'll cover more ground that way. First rule of an RPG is... No, first rule of horror movies is never split the party. In RPGs it can help. Maybe. I don't know. I might be talking out of my ass there. But anyway, let's see what these twins are all about. So many of the twins' actions occur twice per turn, uh, as indicated by the double sword action. Okay, that's fine. Roll twice, perform them as separate attacks on the same target. As you battle, place all the action cards they perform in a line. If either of these two combinations occur in a row, reveal card 20. Otherwise, if you survive the encounter, reveal card 21. Okay, so if I get two fives or two sixes, like I did in the last encounter, uh, I reveal a card. Otherwise... Uh, we just keep going. I'm going to prop that there to remind me. Here are the twins. Oh, this is so cool. Greg, the artwork in this is brilliant. Benjamin did such a good job. Okay, so here are the twins. They have 10 health between them. Uh, but because there's two of them, they attack. Now, I got attacked by the twin on the right, which means if I'm facing this way, it's the twin on the right. I'm guessing I get to choose which ally suffers damage because it doesn't say roll a 1d8. I'm going to choose thematically that it was the person who's on the right. So as I'm looking at it, it would be on the right, which means uh, two dam one damage is done to Rolf. Okay, uh, so we go into combat against the twins. Um... Leah Frick is going first, because Ally 1 always does. Leah Frick is going to... Yeah, why not? I'm going to Timber Hack. Oh, armor. They have 8 armor. Um, so they are even more powerful than the Doorman. Those are my ally cards. I'm just going to put them over here for now. So, I'm going to Timber Hack, which might be foolish, because they can do... Uh, they can do quite a lot of damage. Uh, I'm going to do four. Uh, use 4 HP. I'm going to roll my D8... And my result is going to be a 4. Timberhack at 4 does 4 damage, so that's four of their, half of their armor gone. Uh, he is then going to recoup. That's a 2. He doesn't get anything. Oh, yikes, that's bad. Uh, okay. Rolf. Rolf is going to spend... He's got 4 armor. They could take a lot of damage if this goes badly. Rolf is going to... He's going to send his creature to feed. I'm just going to try and do the big damage. Straight out the gate. Roll the dice. That's a six. Six does six damage. So that's four HP, uh, four armor gone and two HP gone. No special abilities, unfortunately. Um, and uh, his recoup. Ah! Dice off camera. Dice off camera. There we go. That's a three. Nothing happens. Grr. Okay, the twins are going to go. That's a one. So it only matters if two things happen in a row. So I'm just going to leave those there. And I will, I'm just for space on screen, I'm not going to do these in a row. Uh, I'm going to do this uh, in such a way that if five or six comes out, I will lay them out specifically just so that we can see them. The twins are doing a one, which is twin punch. On a five to eight, they will attack the same character twice for one damage. That is going to be Rolf, and they didn't do any damage. That's fine by me. 
They are going to recoup to see if they can get some of their health back. That's a seven. They get one. Okay, Leofric only has one health. Uh, his one is... His zero, rather, is relatively weak. He does one damage on a six to eight, but it does happen twice. I'm going to rest him instead, because I want to get that health back. Do I use it straight away? I'm going to use it straight away. I'm not going to risk these rests. I can see the value in, in saving them up, but... That's a three. That's a four. He does get one health back. Uh, so the rest was worth it. Okay, Rolf um, also only has one. His does one damage on a five to eight. It's the problem. You do these big moves and then you have to kind of recoup a little bit. Um, Rolf's going to try attacking. So five to eight does one damage. That's not. Then going to try recouping. Seven. That's two health back. And done. All right, uh, the twins are going to throw a four. Dual slice. Uh, this happens twice. I'm supposed to roll twice for that actual attack, aren't I? Kabbalist says, are you adding the recoup and rest? You get both. Oh my goodness, did I just totally misread that too? Uh, I rushed through that too quickly, didn't I? So uh, the plus one rest is plus one health out the gate. I was reading it as plus one to the dice roll result. You mean the actual health result. So for rolling a three with a rest, he would actually get nothing plus one health. Do I have that correct now? I may have made a big mistake there, but we'll carry on. Um, right, that's what I was checking. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, roll twice and perform. Oh, whoops! Yes, I was supposed to roll that twice, wasn't I? Okay, I'm going to do that better this time. So, uh, yeah, Rolf would have actually taken one damage. Uh, so, my mistake, when you have the two swords, you're supposed to roll uh, two dice. It's not that the attack happens twice off the same roll, you roll the same roll twice. So, Rolf took one damage last turn, now we're doing the dual slice this turn. That is a seven, so it's Rolf again, that's a two and a six. Uh, the two does nothing, but the six does do two damage. So, that's two armor off Rolf. Um, so, if you've got plus one recoup, and would then get another plus one HP for the rest. Ah, I see. Uh, so I did play that slightly incorrectly. I don't think it's actually made a major difference. Um, Rolf would still have only got one health last turn. I think we're good. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so that was the dual slice. So And then they're going to recoup. Eight. They get two health back. Three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They can only have one. Back, they're back to max. Leofric. Um... Do I want to rest him again? Because he can't do much right now. His splinter attack is only so okay. Hmm. Alternatively... Right. <sighs> I'm going to do splinter with Leo Frick. Uh, this is a dual attack, so he rolls twice. Five to seven, he does one damage. Uh, eight, he does two damage. Wow, he does nothing. That was useless. Yeah, okay, got that, Greg. So yes, uh, basically whatever your rest state is at, when you then choose to use it, you get uh, all the bonus health that you've saved up. Um, Leo Frick doesn't heal either. That's terrible. Okay, Rolf is going to slice? No. Oh, this is bad. Okay, Rolf is going to spend two to use his bag of blood, which I'm going to mark to say that I've used it. Uh, and um, Leofric gets two luck. Which means that he can roll an extra die and use the better one. 
Uh, and if he's using a double attack, he rolls three dice and use the better two. Uh, Rolf is then going to recoup. Oops, that cocked. That's a five. He's going to get one health back. This is bad. The twins are attacking me again. They're attacking with a four. They are attacking Rolf again for two damage. So he's down to one health and no armor. And I have no rebuilding of armor anywhere. Ah! This is bad. Uh, the twins would recoup, but there's no point because they're at full health. Uh, Leofric. He has the luck, which is something. Um, but his antlet is very weak. He's going to lose a luck this turn if I don't use it, but I'm wondering if I just need to power him up and then really use the luck to smack them. So he is going to rest for one. Uh, he is going to recoup, but he is probably going to use that rest too. So his recoup roll is a three, so he gets nothing. Ugh. I'm going to risk it. I'm going to leave that rest there. Uh, he loses a luck. Rolf is also going to rest, because he desperately needs to recover. And then he's going to recoup. Six is one health, and he's going to use his rest, so he gets two health back, and we're going to hope for the best. Then the twins are going to attack, and they're going to do two. Okay, that's good. Dual kick, that's weaker. I like that. And they're attacking Leofric with a three and an eight. That's two damage, so he takes two armor damage. Okay, I can deal with this. Uh, Leofric is going to rest... No, he's not. He's going to attack, because he's got his luck. Uh, he's going to use Antlered. I'm really not... Sorry, Greg. I apologize. I'm really misunderstanding something here. So you're saying that he's got the plus one, he gets the plus one, but it doesn't use the plus one. So it only clears after they get the plus three. So if I have that plus one there, he just gets plus one consistently until I push it up. Or at least until the encounter ends. I have very, very much misunderstood something here, sorry. But since you're here, I would like to clear that up. Anything over the roll of a one, you get a plus one bonus. So Leofric should have an extra health, is what you're telling me. Or is it that as soon as I choose to recoup, I use whatever rest is there and then the rest goes away? Sorry, I, I really feel like I've messed this one rule up and I don't want to do that. Um, while this is going on though, I'm going to start planning my next turn and I will remove cubes and add health as necessary. Uh, Leofric therefore is going to splinter. So he's going to attack. Uh, he gets two dice. Five to seven, one damage. Eight, two damage. Oh, he rolls three dice, so that cocked. Well, six, seven, and eight. That is three damage. Okay, so I'm recouping now. Oh, so I see. You decide to rest, you roll for recoup, and as long as it's not one, you add an HP to your result. Got that. That makes sense. But then the rest is not used. It's just an automatic usage. Oh, I've just caught it up. Got it, got it, got it. Now I understand how that works. That does actually make sense from what I read earlier. I just interpreted it slightly differently, which is one of the problems, right? You can, the rules make complete sense. And actually what Greg is saying right now in chat makes total sense to me, but I read one thing slightly differently and you, you unfortunately you just can't account for player error. Uh, my apologies for messing that up. So if I rest again the next turn, this goes up to there, and then I get the plus two. And then if I rest again the next turn, this goes up to there, and I get plus two. But then it clears regardless. Or I get plus three, sorry, up here. That's what I'm understanding. So that should, I've got my plus one, but that token stays in place. 
unless I break the chain, which I just did by doing an action. Got it. Uh, okay, Rolf. Uh, I'm just going to keep playing while we're finishing clarifying that. Rolf uh, could end this with a lucky roll, but I doubt that's going to happen. Oh, and that's the end of Leofric's lap, too. Did Leofric recoup? No. Leofric's recoup is useless. Leofric is not good at getting health back. Rolf is going to... I'm, I'm probably killing him now, but I'm going to slice. That's a four. That does three damage. Boo. Uh, he's going to recoup. Seven. Two health. Much better. Still probably going to die. Uh, the twins do a one. Twin punch. Okay, I'm fine with that. They are attacking Leofric, but they miss with both attacks. I'm really fine with that. Uh, okay. Leofric is going to go for Antler. So this is six to eight, one damage. I'm just going to try and beat them up at this point. Uh... Why did I roll this? I didn't need to roll that. But these rolled a 1 and a 5, so he doesn't do anything. That's annoying. He is going to recoup. That's a 6, which means he gets a health back. And then Rolf is going to use Slice again, because why not? If I roll the right... If I roll an 8... Oh, no, I don't kill them right now. But I will certainly do a lot of damage. Uh, whoop. 8! Amazing! That does 3 damage to these guys, and it inflicts them with Dwindle. Which now means that uh, they lose one attack damage. So I'm going to put that on there to indicate that. They have dwindled for a turn. So for this next turn, they get minus one attack damage. Okay, so uh, Rolf is going to recoup. Oops, that's off screen. Where'd that even go? Whoop. Seven. Two health. I don't understand how Rolf is going to make it through this encounter. One! Amazing! Twin punch. That's an 8, so they're attacking him, and they missed him again. The twins suddenly got useless. I like this. Uh, okay. And they're going to recoup. Oops. That's a 7. They get one health back. All right, if I play my cards right, they're dead right now. Leofric is going to splinter. He gets to roll two dice. 5 to 7 is 1. 8 is 2. That's a 5, so they've taken one damage. And he is going to recoup nothing. Rolf, I just want certain damage at this point. He is going to slice, because he's going to get all his health back as long as this hits. I need a three or more. That's a five. That's three damage. The twins are dead. And I never got the things to reveal card 20, so I'm just going to discard card 20. Uh, everybody gets all their stuff back, remembering I'm at plus one armor. Um, so... That's that. And I turn over card 21. Triumph! Increase ally hit, ally hit point thresholds by one. Well, that's nice. So everyone gets an extra hit point. As you strike the final blow, the remaining twin falls on the body of his dead brother. He pulls a cylinder out of his belt and presses his finger to the top. With a rush of wind, their bodies turn to dust and disappear into the cracks between the tile. The cylinder hits the ground and rolls off into the shadows. Half a mask lies in front of you ominously. Well, well. I can leave the mask and go after the cylinder. I can take the half mask, or I can just leave them in general because something about them makes me uneasy. Um, if I take the twin's mask, uh, that is an item. It's a combat item. Uh, I may use the ability three times. If I do, I discard it. Uh, slip up. If you roll one on an action, an ally gets encore, which means if an action misses, they roll again. Uh, that's quite nice, actually. Um, I'm kind of interested in this cylinder, though. Like, what did that just do? And I haven't rolled many ones yet. I'm going to go after the cylinder, so I reveal card 23. The dust. Roll 1d8. 7. You sweep the floor. After a few moments, the cylinder is in your grasp. It's a sinister thing not to be trusted, but you have it. I have the dusting cylinder. At any point, you may press the button on the cylinder. If you choose to do this, reveal card 102. Um... Okay. Not sure what I think about that. I'm going to give that to Leofric for now. 
I have a feeling that's just going to obliterate my character. But we'll see, we'll see. I'll wait till I'm in a dire situation and then maybe I'll press it. Uh, I'm going to reveal card 25. The Dim. After a few twists and turns, you come to a dead end. The wall is plain stone with one small square dead in its centre. There are abstract symbols on it and a horizontal slit in the middle. Do you have a key? Well, no, actually. I never picked a key up. I could have got one. If I'd failed to find the cylinder, I'd have found a key. But I don't. Uh... If I fail to unlock it or don't have a key, reveal card 27. Dead heat. You turn around and attempt to make to go a different way. You make a few turns and your path grows dark. The it uh, If you have one of these items, I do, I have the bag of blood. The item is soaked in glowing blood, producing some light. You find yourself at another dead end. There's a small series of shelves in front of you. They are bare, except for a single vial of another glowing red liquid. You pocket them and turn to find another path. You can tell you are heading in a new direction. The halls are changing. You can start to see small patches of red moss on the walls. The air smells like decay. Okay, uh, equip this card, reveal card 31. I'm going to give that to Leofric because he doesn't have a uh, thing. Reveal card 31, so 29, 28, 29, and 30, go. Tale of two passengers. You stand in front of two corridors. The right is at an incline with beds of inverted mushrooms and red moss draping down. The left descends into darkness. If Leofric's in your active party, which he is, his jackalope Magnus gets in a tussle with an undersnail. After a short skirmish, Magnus crushes the shell snail with his antlers. Proud, Magnus stomps his foot. Jackalope Justice is increased to a three... Uh, three damage attack. Three damage attack? Jackalope Justice. Oh, wonderful! So if Leofric dies, he now does more damage. Do I head down the fungus corridor or the dark corridor? Well, I've got my bag of blood, right? So I can still see. I'm going to go down the dark corridor, so I'm going to skip ahead to card 47. I do feel... This is one of those fascinating things. I feel bad throwing this many cards out of the game, but... You know, that's the deal. Oh, whoops. Uh, card 31. Yeah, that should be that. So Jackalope Justice is now a three damage attack. I must remember that. The dark. It's getting dark fast. Luckily, the, car the corridor is narrow and you can feel your way forward. But it won't be long before you tumble off a ledge or something far worse. Do you have any of these items? Yes, I have the bag of blood. Card 48. Head down. The object produces a pinch of light. It's enough for you to hobble forward without fear of serious injury. You continue until something blocks your way. An underdweller. His head is down as he pulls something toward you on a thick rope. He has no idea you're in the way. At least, not yet. You must decide. I will cover up my light source and hide until he's passed. Or, I will attempt to attack the Underdweller while he can't see me. <laughs> Scott says, I've got my bag of blood, David Kingsman Esquire. Definitely a normal thing to say, that is fine. Correct. <laughs> so, I can choose to attack the Underdweller. Uh, hmm. Or I can hide and let him go by. I'm going to attack him while he can't see me. I'm going to roll a d8, see what happens. That's off camera. That's a five. The Underdweller is killed quickly, but there's something else. Reveal card 49. Oh, I keep doing that. 49. The Little Lurker. Oh, this is an encounter, and I didn't even know it was coming. Oh, that's so clever. This card is not red, it's black, so you do not know that something is coming. The Little Lurker. Special rules. When the encounter begins, allies suffer Intimidate for two turns. Okay, Intimidate... Uh, ...means... ...they force a 1 HP action on the next turn, so they can only do their second mo most weak attack. The Little Lurker does not use action cards. Each turn... Oh, I should have shuffled these back in, shouldn't I? Each turn uh, starts with one standard attack and ends each turn with one recoup. If you defeat him, reveal card 50. Yeah, so he's this little guy here. I sort of feel like he sits there kind of going... Until something comes along. Um, that's my impression of a Little Lurker. But he only has one attack and he only has one recoup. So we just do them by default. He has eight health and four armor. Uh, and I'm shuffling these, but I don't actually need them. 
just because I forgot to do so. I probably made the twins slightly easier on myself by not having a couple of sixes in that deck, which is cheeky, but there we go. Such is the danger of playing things on stream. If you don't do something, you don't catch it. You're not... I'm split focused between chatting and explaining things and actually doing them. That is four armor and eight health on this guy. Uh, and I start the combat. So Leofric has to do a level one attack, uh, which in his case is Splinter. He rolls two dice, five to seven. Okay, he's gonna do one damage, so that's an armor taken off. He is still gonna recoup. Uh, he recoups eight, which is three health. He has three health, which means I now use the boost meter. Uh, yeah, so I get three, all three health goes, oh no, he's used one, sorry. Two of those health go onto my boost meter and one comes back because I have the extras. Uh, if that maxes out, I get strength for the next turn, uh, which gives me plus one on an action roll. Um, okay, Rolf has to do a level one HP action. That is prune. That was a. Did that roll on? Yeah, that rolled on. That's a one. So he does nothing. He's going to recoup. Whoop. Oh, he's going to recoup with cleanse. And cleanse lets me remove a status effect on a target. He is going to remove Leofric's intimidation. Oh, in Leofric's upkeep phase, that should have gone to one. In his own upkeep phase, this is going to go to one. And he is intimidated, but Leofric can now do whatever he wants. Uh, the le uh, the um, little lurker is going to attack. He's automatically doing the only action he can, or it can. He's attacking Rolf with a four, which is one damage. And then he's going to recoup. Uh, he can't recoup. He doesn't have any extra health. Back to Leofric. Leofric can do whatever he wants. He is going to timber hack. Uh, this is his most powerful attack. And whoop. That's a five, which means it does five damage. So that's all of its armor gone and two health. That's much better. Uh, he is still going to recoup because he needs his health back now. That's a four. That gives me one. And Rolf is still intimidated. So he has to do his level one attack, which is his prune. That's a four. That's a damage. Uh, he's going to recoup. Eight, that's three health. Uh, he can only take two of those, so he gets two back plus a bonus. And his Intimidate is now gone. And the Lurker is going to do his regular attack. One, he misses. Recoup. Eight, he gets one health back. Six damage left. Um, Leofric's going to send his Jack Rabbit, or Jackalope, sorry, after him with a Jack attack. Uh, we're going to roll, that's a 7, a jack attack. Now that does 3 damage and pierces the enemy, which means I ignore armor. Okay, that's fine, doesn't matter. He is going to recoup. That's a 3, that does nothing. Uh, Rolf, now not intimidated, is going to spend 4 health to feed on this guy and just do his best to ensure it's very, very dead. That's a 2. That was a rubbish roll, but it was a two, so he only takes two damage. Grr. Uh, Rolf gets no health back. This guy... Oops. Roll that properly. Uh, he's going to attack Rolf for one damage, and then recoup for nothing. Leofric is just going to use Antlered. There's no reason not to. Two and two. He does nothing. That is disappointing. Um... He is going to recoup for six. That's one health. Rolf is going to spend that to prune. That's a seven. Prune does two damage. The little lurker is very, very dead. I defeated the little lurker. I reveal card 50. And everybody is back up to uh, their restored values. Uh, there we go. That was much easier. Now I've got the hang of this. That was a much better flow. Card 50 says, Drop in the bucket. The Underdweller's cargo, a blubbery fish in a bucket, dies with a shrill and a heavy expulsion of gas. Oof. It's another nasty scene that provides a bouquet of new smells. Reveal an action card. Okay. Shuffle these up. Let's see what I get. 
That's a three. I get a bucket of fish chum. I find an array of fish-related supplies next to the slain swimmer and feel compelled to take it with me. I have no idea why, but fair enough. Um, I get one use of this. I can eat it for strength plus two for one turn, which means I get plus two to my highest roll. That's going on Rolf, because he can do nasty... Th well, it could go on either one of them, actually. Uh, no, that's actually going to go on Thingy, because I can do some armor piercing early on if I do that, which might be quite nice. Uh, okay. And then I assume I reveal card... Yes, reveal card 51. Whoop! The ooze sluice. That's another lovely phrase. You walk through an arched doorway into a small chamber. Thankfully, your phosphorus surroundings provide enough light to see. In the center are two large metal containers. Next to one of the containers, the body of a dead underdweller lies in a pile of red and white mushrooms that have spilled out of an overturned barrel. On both metal containers are spigots. A black liquid flows from each spigot into a channel on the floor. This channel snakes out of the room and down another corridor. You can't help but feel a sense of discord and abandonment in these chambers that were once alive with purpose. Now it's just dead bodies and tra trails of blood. You decide to follow the channel of liquid. It takes you through a series of descending corridors to the entrance of another chamber. As you cross the threshold into this new area, you hear a splash, a single plunk, like a rock dropped into a lake. I can wait and listen and reveal two cards, or I can don't care what horrors high ahead, I'm going in. Well, I'm the cautious type, so I'm going to wait and listen. I reveal card 52 and 55. Uh, this may or may not. Oh, that looks like I just don't. No, I'm attacking anyway. I'm just. I'm attacking something different. The ooze obelisk. You wait for another splash that doesn't come. Slowly, you peer around the corner into an enormous circular chamber. Here, the black ooze is collecting in a pool. In the middle of the pool is an island of chiseled stone with a triangular obelisk in its center. A shimmering cloud of dust hovers above the monument, shifting in unison like swarming birds. Otherwise, there are no signs of life. You work your way around the outside of the chamber when the dust cloud begins to pulse outward in your direction. Well, that's bad. Ooh, Zobel is set up. You only need action cards one to four, so I can take fives. You know what? I'm just going to leave the fives and sixes in there and discard them. Oh, I literally only need one, two, three, and four. I see. One, three, two, and four. It only gets four turns. Uh, and something happens if I don't defeat it before it runs out of cards. Okay, well, I love how all of these things behave slightly differently. Ten and ten? What? Yeah, I'm not defeating that in four turns. Well, maybe I am. I have some advantages. Now the question is, do I waste one of Leofric's turns giving himself strength because if he rolls well, he can pierce the enemy and just do damage straight through the armor. Potentially up to four of it at once, but eh. Woof. It has no recoup. Okay, that's nice. All right. Uh... Yeah, I'm going to try it. I'm going to eat the bucket of fish chum. It's a zero HP move attack. I'm discarding this card after use, and next turn, Leofric has two strength. I assume that's right, Greg, because the upkeep phase wouldn't take his two strength away. Um... I'm just going to do two of those to remind myself it's two. Because that's his move, right? So he doesn't get... Uh, he doesn't get it taken away in the first upkeep phase. I assume he gets that next phase. Oh, just a mark on the back of that card. Um, Greg says correct. Excellent. Okay, uh, Leofric has done. He is going to recoup, because I might get some boost out of it. Uh... <laughs> no. Uh, all right, Rolf. Um, Rolf is going to feed straight out of the gate. That's four HP. Uh, I got to try and do some damage to this guy right now. Woo! Five. That is five damage. So half of its armor has been taken away. He is going to recoup. 
That's two, that does nothing. All right, this thing has his four cards. He's going to do four attacks, and then something happens. Three. Uh, that is Dust Devil. Okay. See what happens. That is... Uh, he. Oh, that's nasty. So he's doing two damage to Rolf, and he's also crippling him. Uh, cripple means damage output is 50% less rounding down for one turn. And also two damage. Ouch. Okay, this may or may not be a good move. Uh, maybe I just timber hack. I was thinking what I might actually do is use jack attack, because then I have a very solid chance of piercing armor and just doing some damage. But timber hack would do so much more damage, and I'd have to get through the armor anyway. So I'm going to timber hack, which is 4 HP on Leofric. But I have strength plus two, so I roll. I add two to this die. Um, yeah, whoop! That is an eight anyway. Ah! Always when you have the ability, you don't need it. Okay. Well, that is six damage. So that's five armor and one health taken off this thing. And I give an ally luck. Luck lets me roll twice and pick the best roll. I'm going to give that to Rolf, I think. Um, actually, no, I'm going to give it to Leofric because uh, Rolf is going to do half damage this turn. So I think it's better that Leofric has it. Uh, Leofric's going to recoup. That's a three. He does nothing. He is really, really bad at getting his own health back. The obelisk... No, sorry, Rolf is going to... Uh, he has that left. I'm just going to rest Rolf because he's crippled anyway. So I'm going to rest and then I'm going to recoup for a seven. So that's two health back plus he gets one from the rest. And now this thing does number one, pulse. It attacks Rolf for three, which is one damage. Okay. This obelisk is strange. All right, Leofric. Leofric has luck, which means I'm going to use Splinter. And with luck, that means I roll three dice and I pick the highest two. Five and three. Well, that means I do one damage. That was very pathetic. That luck was barely worth it. Uh, but there we go, it's one damage, it's, it's taken something, so two, four, six, eight damage left. Uh, then he's going to recoup. Two, still useless. Rolf is now no longer strictured by the uh, um, cripple, so he is going to feed. I'm just going to go all out on this guy. Really. Two damage. Four HP for that. I'm then going to recoup. I lose my rest bonus. Uh, at least he gets a health back. Alright, the obelisk is going to do its level two attack, which is reverb. Uh, that didn't, that cocked. Uh, that is Leofric for a six, which is one damage and intimidate. So he has got to do his level one health which is going to kill him. Wow! I think he literally just intimidated Leofric into killing himself. Because he forces a level 1 attack action and Leofric only has 1 health. Welp! That's what happens, right? Um... I'm assuming Leofric gets the action. Well, does Leofric get the action? Because he's dying as he uses it, but he costs that to do it. So he's splintering, he's using his axe to splinter in the last thing. He's going to hurl a massive attack against this ooze obelisk. He's going to deal two damage, and in the process, because he's attacking a giant piece of stone with an axe, a piece of metal flies off and lodges in his forehead. And that was the end of Leofric. Uh, now, Leofric's Jackalope uses his death move, which, remember, was boosted by that card we found. So it now does three damage to the obelisk. And 
Dane, the Ratakin, comes back in his place. Okay. This is like Angry Vega from Street Fighter. Not remotely. He's literally strapped blocks of wood to the back of his wrists and then filled them full of spikes. This guy is cool. Uh, okay, but his turn is gone because Leofric took it. Leofric doesn't get to recoup. He's dead. Uh, so, Rolf's turn. Rolf... I could spend a health. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to spend the health. It's going to give me a slightly higher chance uh, to kill this thing this round. <laughs> Scott says, go ham, little jackalope. <laughs> Quite. Um, that sucks in more ways than I can possibly count. Uh, because now Rolf is at risk of being killed. Oh, and I failed to kill the damn thing before it used its fourth attack. I was so close. Uh, six for eight. So he's attacking this guy for four damage. No, he's attacking everybody for four damage. Well, Rolf is dead. Oh, did no, Rolf didn't recoup. I just failed the hit. Rolf gets one health back. Uh, he had two things and a health. No, Rolf is dead. Uh, his death move is he gets Encore on a chosen target, which is going to be irrelevant because this is about to finish. And we get Millicent, the Silk Weaver. Two armor, five health. Woo, you go through characters a bit quick in this sometimes. All right, I did not defeat this thing before its time ran out. Uh, oh, that was the twins. I don't need the twins anymore. I did need this. Uh... Reveal card 56. Stomach spin. The dust cloud above the obelisk bursts outwards, creating a cyclone that pulls the pool with it. A whirlpool of onyx ooze stretches out onto the chamber floor, catching you in its wake. You are sucked down as the pool begins to drain. Your feet hit the bottom as the last of the ooze drains out. Unsightly horrors emerge around you. Roll a d8. Oops. That's a three. The giant blubbery creature spews a piss-yellow foam at you. Your misfortune knows no bounds. You duck backwards. I reveal I'm being attacked, and one ally is intimidated at the start of the encounter. I reveal card 58. The obelisk, I'm assuming, is done at this point. The lurker. Okay, so I've beaten up its baby, and now it's come out for vengeance. That... Seems completely reasonable, to be honest. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 and 10 again. Okay, so no 4s, 5s, and 6s in this deck now. And this, I think, just for my timing, this is going to be my... I'll finish this fight, and then I'm going to be done for this stream. And I will continue this play. I'm going to save all my progress as best as I can. Uh, and I will continue this uh, in a secondary stream. Um, because I'm sort of talking this out longer. Like, the game running time is 15 minutes to 2 hours. Uh, but because of all my talking time, it's running a little longer. Uh, and um, I do, unfortunately, have to finish my stream... Uh, like I have things I have to do this evening. So this will be this fight will be the end of it. But let's see what we can do. So remove all four, five, and six action cards, shuffle and use the remaining normally. If I survive, I reveal a card. Um, the lurker attacks. Wow. So the lurker can spawn things and then attack them instead of you? Or it attacks them as well as you. No, it attacks them instead of you. Okay, I'm fine with that. All right, well, let's see what these guys have. Oh, I've uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, because I've got plus one to each of those. And somebody is intimidated. And I'm going to say that that is two, three, three, one, two, three. Uh, I'm going to say Millicent is intimidated just because her um, level one attack is better. 
Uh, okay. So, Dane attacks first. Uh, I'm going to do the all-out thing, I think. I'm going to go for a Rust Slice. So I'm going to beat the Lurker with Tetanus. Uh, roll the d8. That's a 7. 7 on a Rust Slice is 6 damage. That's nice. So that's a bunch of its armor down. Uh, oh, I would have bled it if I'd rolled an 8. Never mind. Uh, then he's going to recoup. That's a 6. That gives him a health back. Millicent is going to... Oh, she has to do... She's got the Intimidate, so she has to do Backstitch. Uh, whoop. 6. That is 3 damage. I'm okay with that. And is then going to recoup. 6. That is a health. And then this thing is going to do a burp. Its attack 3 is a burp. Whoop. It rolls 4, and it's going to attack Dane. 4 is 2 damage. And then it recoups and heals 1, but it can't because it's, it doesn't recoup at all. It's got full health. Uh, okay, Dane is going to... We're just going to keep going Fallout. He's going to do a Split Fist, uh, which is his level 3 attack, or 3 HP attack. 4. That's going to do 4 damage, so that's gone as is 3 of its health. And then he's going to recoup a 7, which is going to give him 2 of that health back. I'm happy with that. Millicent is now going to use her Silk Barrage. I just saw she's basically carrying a harpoon with Silk attached to it. That's amazing. Silk Barrage, it's her most powerful attack. Whee! 7. 6 damage. Oh, yes! And she's going to try and recoup, and is not going to. The Lurker is doing a level 1, which is the Tongue. Ugh, I'm going to get licked. Uh, that is uh, attacking Dane, but misses. Dane is going to Bloodlet, which is his uh, 2 HP attack. He's going to roll a 1 and miss. Dane, you suck. But he is going to get those 2 health back, so that seems like a fair exchange to me. Millicent is going to do her 1 HP attack, which is her backstitch that worked very nicely for us before. And it's going to do the 1 damage needed, and the Lurker is dead. Shame, I kind of would have liked to see it spawn a minion for itself and then eat it. Um, basically, if you roll a 2 on any of its attacks, it spawns a glob. And uh, category B... No, sorry, if you roll... Uh, the high end of things, its first thing is it spawns a glob, and then if you roll a 2 on any of its attacks thereafter, it attacks the glob instead of you, which is just funny. Uh, but they would have been three new enemies, which I didn't have to see. Uh, and I saw a card there I probably wasn't supposed to see that implies there's an even bigger one. Alright, reveal card 63 for defeating it. Barbs and blubber. Increase ally armor point thresholds by one. So that's now up plus two, which is nice. Blubber, fish guts, and goo are everywhere. You do your best to shake off the gore when you notice something is inside one of the translucent globs. Dig in. All right, we're going to dig into a thing that didn't even spawn. Whoop, five. With a quick slash, you cut open the glob. There's a key inside. Uh, the barbed key. Um, so I have a key now, so I put a mark on the keys. Uh, equip this card, reveal card 64. Uh, which is this one. Down the drain. The only way out is the drain in the center of this mess. You peer down. It's dark. You can see about five feet of vertical tunnel. The passage looks narrow enough to shimmy down. What do you do? I can go down the drain into the dark, I can toss the bag of blood down the drain if I have it, or I could drop a coin of the spire down the drain if I have it. The coin of the spire was the opposite reward if I'd rolled higher when I got the bucket of fish chum. Um, I am going to throw the bag of blood down the tunnel. Uh, because I just don't feel like randomly climbing down a drain. That seems like a very bad idea. So I discard the bag of blood, which is a shame. But I look at card 65. The Expanse. 
The open, you open the top of the bag to ensure there's a glow, then you drop it down. The bag flails wildly, then crashes into the drain wall, leaving a luminous splatter. The glow reveals something shiny. You climb down to investigate. Randomly pick a deceased ally, if there are any. This ally has returned from the reflective expanse and should be returned to your ally deck. Set aside this card and equip it if this ally comes back into play. If there are no dead allies, discard Vacant Soul. Punishment, Vacant Soul. Punishment being the name for... So, like, for example, uh, when the little lurker came out and intimidated me, the starting the battle with uh, Intimidate was a punishment. This punishment is an equip. It says, at the start of encounters, exhaustion for three turns to the ally with this card equipped. Exhaustion means they cannot recoup or rest, and if they had a clear uh, a rest meter, it gets cleared. Well, it means I get an ally back, and I think that means that we need to have a jackalope back on our team. Or do we, actually? No, I'm going to bring back our silversmith. So these two go together. Uh, she is a vacant soul, uh, and therefore takes a little bit of gearing up to, you know, get herself ready to attack. Uh, and she may or... Oh, no, I don't choose, do I? It's random. Sorry. Anyway, the same thing applies. Whoever this is, uh, you know, they're a, a zombie-like creature who takes a bit of bashing around the head before they realize they need to defend themselves. Uh, and it's going to be... Uh, first person to type into the chat number one, two, or three. That is the result I am going to go for from this pile. Two. Okay. It is Rolf, the kill cow. Okay, so our little feeding creature is back. Alright, so he goes back into the ally deck and gets shuffled in, and when Rolf comes back out, becomes a vacant soul, and on we go. I am going to pause this adventure there because unfortunately I do have to stop for the evening. But I hope you've enjoyed this so far. I am loving this game. Greg, you've done a phenomenal design here. Uh, I love it. It has absolutely got that sense of the um, uh, the game books of, of yesteryear, uh, which I adored. Actually, uh, I mentioned that I was going to be streaming this to Scott on his stream last night. Uh, and we actually ended up chatting about uh, the different game books that we had experienced. I'm just going to bring myself up for a minute. Um, uh, my favorite was a Fantasy Flight one called Robot Commando, which, I mean, giant mechs, you know. I'm a big mech fan, so that was always fun. Uh, but I love those books, and this is, this is like a modern reinterpretation of them, and I love it. I, I played through the House of Danger, Choose Your Own Adventure game, and I really, really enjoyed that too. But that felt like a modernizing of the game book. Whereas this feels like it is a modern game book, if that makes sense. Like it's it's uh, uh, it's slightly um, it's its own unique thing, and I love that. Uh, and the story is great. The artwork is beautiful. I am fascinated to know what is in this spire, and I will continue this story. Uh, this will be. I was going to announce an RPG as the next stream that I do, but I am going to delay that by one, and I am going to finish this next stream because I am enjoying it so much. I really want to make sure that I do it with you guys rather than just doing it on my own. So thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, You'll also notice that I don't have any of my usual socials and things on the screen. That's because I'm using a new computer. I'm slowly switching everything over. I was temporarily borrowing one. I'm actually using my wife's computer right now, and then shortly I will have my own, and that will be my final setup. But unfortunately, uh, I had to switch over to my wife's at short notice because my previous one died, and I haven't had a chance to copy my socials across yet. Um, Scott says, I just noticed the t-shirt. Very stylish. Thank you. I rather like them. It's uh, obviously Cass's design, and uh, I decided it was nice to have something uniform on the stream. Anyway, um, Instagram, Once Upon a Die podcast. Uh, Twitter, Upon a Die podcast. Um, YouTube, just search Once Upon a Die. If I get about 20 more subscribers, I'll get that custom URL, and then I'll be able to give it much more easily. Um, please subscribe, please follow anything that you can do to support uh, and Im increase the community that I have building with this would be very much appreciated, thank you. Um, check out Spire's End if you had a good time watching this. It is just landing its reprint for the second edition. Uh, it is awesome. It blew Kickstarter out of the water, I think, and uh, was very, very successful with its first run. So, of course, second run, which is delightful. And that's why I'm doing this. So do go over and check out, I want to say, spiresend.com. Um, and uh, do have a look at that, because I'm loving this. It's a wonderful experience. 
Um, Greg, thank you so much for joining in the channel today. I hope you'll be able to join for the second part of the stream. I will, of course, tell you when that will be. Uh, and everybody else, thank you. If you would like to support me, uh, please do head over to my coffee account. It's ko-fi.com forward slash once upon a die. Uh, that would be amazing. Uh, no worries if not. And I will see you again, uh, hopefully next week. I will announce on Instagram as soon as I have anything. And uh, we will finish off our exploration of the Spire. Thank you again for tuning in. Have a lovely evening and keep rolling those dice until the game is done. Take care.